is the Bloody Disgusting Podcast Network. Back to horror queers. We're talking torture. We're talking martyrs, and we're talking lesbians. And I'm Joe, and I'm Trace, and we're talking what is probably the only film to leave me like feeling empty inside for a significant amount of time after seeing it. Oh God! Oh dear! <laughs> I was really uh, we're, uh, well. I mean, you kind of already said it, but I know it wasn't the title of the film. But everyone, we're talking martyrs. Uh, the original 2008 Pascal. Oh my God, Pascal Loger. Is that how you said? Correct. That? Oh yes. my God! Yay! That well is the done. only time I will pronounce a French name correctly tonight. So I will be a Joe <laughs> this week. No, I uh, I was very depressed, like and like not in like in a good mood. I was very out of sorts. Um, on Thursday, I watched the movie on Wednesday. And I couldn't really figure out why. And I do think a lot of it was because, like, residual lingering effects from watching this film. And that may be overselling it or hyperbolizing, like, what it does. But it really had that effect on me. And it's the only film to have ever done that. Wow. That is some high praise and also mildly terrifying. But I don't disagree with you because I really feel like this is the kind of film that gets into your head and it just lingers. Like... I remember the first time I saw this film, I didn't like it at all. Cause I, you know, I watched it. I thought, holy fuck, the pacing on this movie is all over the place. It's like a bunch of movies in one. Whoa. Why the fuck are people thinking that this is such a good film? And then weeks later, mm -hmm. I would come back to it and just think about like, oh my God, that scene. Oh, that thing. Like, it, it's so heavy. It just... It stays with you. I was watching, I was working at a blockbuster when this hit DVD uh, back in, I think it hit the States in 09. And I had just heard, on am bloody disgusting actually, that about how intense it was and how it was one of the, like, the most disturbing films ever made. So mm -hmm. I rented it. And yeah, I just, I mean, I, it was the first time in my life I'd ever just had such a visceral reaction to a film. And I mean, so well, that'll be a good segue then. So everyone, um, if you haven't seen this film or if you have, or you're planning on watching it, extreme trigger warning. Um, yes, <laughs> <laughs> it is. It is a torture porn film and we'll get into this debate a little bit later, but I would argue that it does justify the torture in it, but that will be a contentious opinion for some people. And yes. I totally understand that. Yeah, yeah, we're back in the realm of Hostel 2, where I have a feeling we're going to have a bunch of people saying, I don't want to revisit this film, I can't watch it, it's misogynistic, it's all violence against women, it's torture for torture's sake. Ladies and gentlemen, we are going to try to change your mind on that fact. I um, So you you had sent me an article from, because again, we, we actually did do quite a bit of research for this film, Um, and you sent me an article from Collider, and I think it was Perry Nemiroff, it just said Perry, I wasn't sure if it was her or not, but I'm assuming it was. But her thought point was, I hate this movie, but I don't think it's a bad movie. And I was like, yeah. I can, I understand that. <laughs> yeah, that that actually seems completely justifiable. And I feel like that's the kind of debate that I would actually like people to come into some of these more difficult to watch films with. You don't have to like it to appreciate it. And hopefully you can still engage in the dialogue around it regardless. Well, so did you, you want, you streamed this, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So I actually do have the, the unrated DVD, um, we, we, which um, I think it was Dimension Extreme, although mine doesn't have that label on it. So it was a Weinstein purchase. <laughs> so oh we just God. can't get it. Oh my God. I know. I know. But it came with an introduction by the director um, like that starts before the film. And he oh, basically really? like, okay. yeah, but he starts it going like, thank you for watching this film. I don't know if you've made the correct decision. I don't even know if I <laughs> like this movie. He, he filmed it. Or he made it and wrote it when he was under extreme depression. And it shows in this movie because it's a very bleak, dark, nihilistic film. Mm -hmm. it's very much like maybe humanity is not good and we <laughs> we cause our own suffering and we are deserving of the pain we bring upon ourselves yes oh 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 and um everyone so this uh i did want to point out so this is our pick for the winner of our re our listener survey that we did at the end of last year so you can thank mr brian conmey for 
<laughs> subjecting all of you to this. No, no, no. I just. But thank you. Uh, we actually did have this on our to cover list at some point, but we had never actually scheduled it because we just neither one of us like wanted to pull the trigger on it. Uh, uh-huh. So thank you, Brian. <laughs> 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 yes, thank you for making a shit or get off the pot, because I'm not going to lie, I was not looking forward to revisiting this film. I wasn't either. This is a five-star film for me, but it's not one that I ever want to rewatch. Although, um, so I, I, well, this is a member of the new French extremity movement, and if you listen to our episode on Calvaire last year, um, it's in that same ballpark. Although hopefully more of you have seen this than Calvaire, and we see that in those download numbers, because uh, <laughs> it's one of our least downloaded episodes. But Well, this one's also easier to track down. We appreciate yes. that Calvaire is not an easy film to find, so Murders, thankfully, is easy to find. But I did go re-listen to that episode, and I do say in that episode that I like to show people Martyrs. <laughs> oh, <laughs> like, <laughs> Which, it, it might seem a little bit sadistic, but it's just like, there's so much to talk about in this movie, and it's also yes. like, for anyone that says, oh, there's not really any extreme horror coming out anymore, like, I, I, I want to see something that's just really going to shock me, and it's like, alright, well, do you like subtitles? Okay, <laughs> let's put on <laughs> Martyrs. <laughs> or I guess in your case, do you like dubbing? <laughs> God, yeah, the film started and it was dubbing and I had to be like, no, because <laughs> I, yeah, because it opens up with this, uh, this man giving us newsreel footage of like mm. a documentary style stuff. And I was like, oh, this is funny. I don't remember him speaking in English for this part, but it also had the, like I had captions on and the captions were completely fucked. Like they were not co- coinciding with what he was saying at all. And I was like, no, something is wrong here. Something has gone horribly, horribly <laughs> wrong. Dubbing! It's so nuts. And also, listeners, we'll save this for the end, and we won't have a big discussion about it, but both of us also did double feature this with the American remake from 2015, which stars Pretty Little Liars, Troy and Belisario, in the Lucy role. So we'll discuss it a little bit, but not in depth, since this obviously isn't a remake episode, po- episode. but we just thought it might be kind of fun just to kind of Make a little compare and contrast. Yeah. So, I don't know. Shall we get into it? Do you want to do your fact sheet? Yeah, we'll do the fact sheet, and then we'll move into the plot. Uh, And just a heads up, we're going to be reverting back to our older structure for this episode, in part because we find that the longer plot description is really good when we're doing funny films or when we're riffing. We've got a lot to say about it. Here, we wanted to make sure that we're giving this film its due diligence, like we really want to unpack everything that this film has going on so it's going to be a shorter plot recap and then we're going to really dive into the issues afterwards yes and if you are a listener who did not want to watch this film i think that'll be really good for us to just go through the plot summary pretty quickly so you get all the major beats and then you can hear us discuss those things so i think that'll work out better but yeah anyway okay so um yes this is martyrs and it first screened at Cannes on in may 2008 uh, and it was released in theaters in France on September 3rd, 2008. Can you imagine being at Cannes and just seeing this with an audience? <laughs> uh, I mean, they've always got a couple of really weird films, but at the same time, like, I I mean, I never saw this in the theaters, and I can't imagine what that experience would have been like. I, I imagine that when the credits rolled, or I guess when the, the, the end title card with the Webster's dictionary definition of Mm -hmm. martyrs pops up Uh, i imagine it was just silence and people sitting there (laughs) what the fuck did we just watch i didn't i didn't look up any like reports of the screenings but i imagine this would have been one that had walkouts or one of those like people fainted or threw up in the theater yeah it played at tiff and there was definitely a report of a bunch of people fainting and puking yeah i couldn't i couldn't actually find the report because it's too long ago that they don't still have those news articles up anymore the internet was just so old back then. It's true. It, it was more than a decade ago. It barely <laughs> exists anymore. Isn't that weird to think 2008 was 12 years ago? I, I don't care for it, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, so and it had, this has a runtime of 99 minutes, which weirdly enough, my DVD said it was 96 minutes, but like it is 99 minutes. So I thought that was weird. It is. Yeah, that's the uh, unrated cut. Well, but that's the thing, though. My DVD is only the unrated cut, and it still said 96 minutes on the box, <laughs> but... I don't know. I don't know. Um, but he yeah. It, three minutes in translation. God. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and this was, uh, we're looking at a budget of 2.8 million euros, which is um, at least today, roughly $3.1 million. Uh, that may have been different back in 2008, depending on the exchange rate, but 
It's not important. Um, this did not open in theaters in the States, so I don't have any um, box office like ranking or grosses for you. Well, actually, I'm sorry. But it did go, over, like I said, in France in September 2008. It made $1.1 million in, in internationally. Um, but that, I mean, that's like Belgium, Finland, France, Italy, Turkey, and the UK. And then also right. South Korea. <laughs> okay. Not us, though, because uh, the, the, no one would ever go see this in theaters. Uh, <laughs> but the Weinsteins did buy this for their Dimension Extreme label, which y'all may remember from the mid-2000s. In terms of reception, uh, oh, I changed up my cheat sheet this week. I don't know if you noticed. So I removed the audience. We're not going to discuss audience scores um, on Rotten Tomatoes, and I'm not going to even bring up Metacritic anymore. I'm just going to do the critics oh. from Rotten Tomatoes, and I'm going to do the letterbox score. Okay. Yeah, I, I figure because, I mean, not that people that are in Letterbox are, like, more... I just like they're more into film than, like, the casual votes that we get on Rotten Tomatoes. So I feel like it might be a better um, representation of what... Audiences think. Yeah, yeah, we'll go with that. So, Rotten Tomatoes were looking at 59%, which is admittedly higher than I thought it was going to be, with an average score of 5.96 out of 10, but a Letterbox score of 7.2 out of 10. So... Hmm. Yeah, this is, I mean, pe- people do like, the, or I'm going to say like in quotes. <laughs> I think okay. people appreciate or respect or go. admire what this movie is and does. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I I legitimately have heard people who say this is their comfort movie or that <laughs> this is a favorite film of theirs. I do think those few those people are fewer and far between, but I do think that there's a really sizable population of people, like horror fans who know and appreciate nuanced, heavy material, right. and they look at this and they say, this is not an easy film to watch, but it is a valuable film to watch. Yeah. Also, I, I didn't even realize this. I, I pulled a quote out from Pascal Logier's introduction, and he actually says, feel very free to hate me. So <laughs> at least, like, he's aware. <laughs> so classically um, French. Yes. So this is not his directorial debut. I think it's his second, maybe third film. But um, yeah, written and directed by Pascal Logier. Um, I have seen... He's most noted for this and The Tall Man, which is uh, his first English language film with Jessica Biel, which I actually really, really, really like. Never seen it. I, I've actually never seen any of his other films, so. Well, okay. So Tall Man is another one where it's like, oh, it becomes a totally different movie about 40 minutes in. Okay. And some people don't like that and but what yeah. it turns into. I had heard that. I I remember when it came out that people were like, this and the Bye Bye Man are the biggest pieces of shit that horror has produced in the last couple of years. Okay, The Tall Man is not on um, Bye Bye Man. I, I, tall Man is actually a four and a half star film. I, I really like it. Um, now, of course, Jessica Biel's in it, and she delivers a wonderful performance. Hmm, so there's no bias here, is what you're saying. <laughs> I know. But it's also like, it's not really a horror movie, and I think that's oh, where okay. I think that's where people like kind of have trouble with it. And then he also did, I think it was last year, maybe two years ago, was, um, Incident in a Ghostland or Ghostland. Yeah. It's kind of been shortened. Another movie with very, tr- like a lot of yeah. drama behind the scenes. And it's mm-hmm. also kind of torture porny, misogynistic. I actually liked it. I didn't love it, but I actually thought it was quite good. Um, but also like this, it's like, oh, there's like a big twist. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I think that one's on Shudder. I remember with that one, it got some bad press because uh, the lead actress got injured on the set and there were complaints about whether or not the set had been, whether it had been made safe for the actors and the actresses. Yeah, it basically, I think Glass cut her face and permanently scarred her. And that was the Mm -hmm. issue is like, she's like, I can't like get roles if I have this scar on my face. And I think there was a big issue with that. So, I mean, obviously that's a reason to like go into the movie with caution, but it's also... Some some might say it's transphobic. Uh, I right. That is the other bit. That'll be a discussion for whenever we cover the episode, which that is in our to cover list because I I would love to dive into it, but we're not talking about that one. Uh, so y'all just go watch that on Shutter or something, or don't. I don't know. But yeah, I that's I mean that, that's really it. I'm not going to go through the cast because I don't know any of these people. Um, unless you think there's anyone that you need to single out. Nope. Nope. I do not recognize most of these people, so... Oh, um, but... Oh, sorry. I'll do one. Oh, my God. Well, I'm going to say Xavier Dolan. How do you say it? <laughs> I say Xavier Dolan. Okay, cool. So that that's him. Uh, <laughs> listeners may know him. He was uh, the opening gay bashing victim in It Chapter 2. Uh... Playing, he's one also of, one of Canada's most famous directors. Yes, absolutely. I've actually never seen one of his films, um, but I, I, I've like I've kept up with them. Like when they go to festivals, he was also in Boy Erased, which came out last mm-hmm. year. 
But yeah, he's uh, he has a very small part in this movie, but uh, he's a baby. I didn't even recognize him when you when you texted me and was like, Xavier Dole. I was like, what? Who are you even talking about? What movie are you watching right now? You sound so fancy with that French accent. It gets me a little hard. Oh, well, thank you. Anything I, I can do to get a rise out of you. I've never gotten a boner during a recording before, so this oh is the first. Oh my god, let's move on. <laughs> during okay. the Martyrs episode. <laughs> okay, um, so okay. That's, that's it. Let's Let's go through this plot. Okay, here we go. After a distraught young girl escapes from a building, the film cuts to a documentary-style camcorder footage from 1971. The girl, Lucy, wasn't raped, but she was abused and is suffering from malnutrition. The footage captures the passing of time, Lucy grows up, and she's befriended by Anna. At this time, it becomes clear that the footage is being shown to Anna by the police who want her help since Lucy is suffering from amnesia about who she is and who did this to her. It is also clear that Lucy is self-harming, and she is seemingly haunted by both vivid nightmares and a scarred, emaciated demon woman, Isabel Chasse. So I will confess that when I first saw this movie, I actually did think that it was a real creature, though, because I didn't know what kind of movie I was about to watch. I didn't know anything about mm-hmm. this film. So I thought this was going to be like, oh, it's like a ghost creature movie. That's cool. Yep. I confess I did not call the reveal coming later. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. I think this early on, you're not meant to. You actually do think that she is being stalked by some creature. And because we're not given any insight into what's happened before she escapes from the building, right. you think, okay, it could be monsters. Yeah. It's entirely plausible. Who knows? Yeah. So at this point, we cut to 15 years later, and we start in with a well-to-do family, the Belfons, who have a conventional Sunday morning breakfast until a woman brandishing a shotgun rings the bell and immediately kills everyone. This, I do want to talk about this sequence a little bit, because I... (laughs) I thought you might. (laughs) Well, it's, I I was, again, I knew it was coming, I knew it was going to happen, and I was still shocked by how upsetting it is, even knowing, like, what... Like, these, who these people are. And, like, granted, we never really know if the kids knew what the parents were doing. I would wager mm-hmm. they did. Oh, really? Okay. Why do you think that? I mean, they have a fucking basement. Like, I, don't, I just feel like that's not something that's, like, easy to hide from your kids. Yeah. Or you've got all these <laughs> fucking people trafficking through your house all yeah. the time. Like, who's that old bitch? What does she do? Why are they going down there? I know this will never get made, but I, I would actually watch, like, a movie, like, a side cool or something that, like, shows the inner work, like, like a Hostel Part 2 thing where it, like, shows the inner workings of the organization. Yeah, I've actually seen a bunch of people complain, like, how did this cult come to get together? How did they get everything set up? How did they co-? I'm just like, you don't need to be an asshole about it. But yeah, I mean, the film shrouds these people in so much mystery that it would be interesting to just get a better sense of, like, so... How did they connect? Like, how did they decide torturing someone to within an inch of their life is going to get them secrets to the afterlife? I I do think I saw reviews where people were like, it's really implausible that this is like that this organization exists. Oh my god! And I'm like, fuck off! I was like, that's the thing you're focusing on in this movie? Okay, like, (laughs) Like, oh my god! I just I can't with people who have criticisms like that. Like, you're either in or you're not, and if you're not, then just fuck off. Mm Hmm. I but um, but yeah, so but, so yeah, basically, like yeah, this is Lucy shooting all these people because it, I I think we we don't really know yet, but I mean it's pretty like she is killing these people because she thinks that they're her torturers, and, and at the time we don't know if this is true or not. And the dad gets killed really quickly. The mom turns around and runs away, and she gets shot in the back. And d- with it's, it's grody, <laughs> yes, but with them with um Xavier Dolan, I don't know, fuck Xavier Dolan, not bad, um. Yeah. <laughs> he, she asks him how old he is and then asks what his parents did or maybe vice versa maybe it's reverse but then she shoots him at the at the breakfast table but you totally think for a hot minute that maybe she's not gonna kill the kids like maybe she's not that kind of psycho and then like the camera just holds on her face and she starts I think we even see a single tear yeah. fall and then she just blows him away in the gut. The performances in this movie, specifically from the actors that play Lucy and Anna, is just, they're so good. Like, there's there's so much eye acting <laughs> from both of them in this yeah. movie. Well, because it's not a dialogue-intensive film, for no. the most part. Like, it's a lot just on these women and what they're giving facially. Yeah. And so this this sucks, but I, I do, yeah, I love the moment before Dolan gets killed. But the the real kicker for me is when she kills the sister. And the sister's hiding under the bed upstairs. And 
making the most noise any person should make (laughs) when they're trying to hide from a vicious killer. And she shoots her through the bed. And, Mm -hmm. oh no, she she shoots the bed but doesn't hit her. I'm sorry, I'm thinking of the remake. Uh, Yeah. (laughs) But yeah, but she's like crawling out and just crying and crying and crying and gets shot. And it's just like, like the the violence in this film, even if we didn't have the torture that comes later, like it's so visceral and realistic and upsetting. Mm -hmm. And like, yeah. And again, at this point, we don't know what who these people are, what they're doing. So it's just like, oh, she might just be killing. Like, I think maybe, I mean, I don't know. Maybe it was trying to be like, oh, she's just nuts after her experience. And she's just going around 100%. killing people. Hundred percent. Yeah. No, because I think in this early section. So really, when I joked that the first time I saw this movie, I thought it was multiple films in one. Mm-hmm. A it lot is, of though. people have actually said, yeah, it's basically a film in three parts, and this first part is, uh, you know, it's our our little brief introduction to these girls. But really, the first part is a home invasion possible is she crazy kind of movie because also the before this like the all the stuff with her getting out like the interrogations and whatever that's all pre-title cards that's essentially a prologue um Mm -hmm. and then yeah this is like really when the movie starts and and i i I was thinking that too because when we discussed the perfection for patreon um i did compare the narrative of that movie to martyrs because it's that also feels like three films in one Mm -hmm. yeah but that's also um, why I like this movie, though. I love that it just changes on you twice. Yeah, it it shifts gears. It's tricky if you're not willing to go along with it. So mm-hmm. I think, you know, when we talked about The Perfection, we talked a little bit about how much I really enjoyed that first act and how I almost wish that it had have stayed that way for the entire film. And part of that is just that was my pr- preferred subgenre like yeah. i i like that idea of people being caught in a foreign country not being able to speak the language and having this terrible hallucinatory experience here i think it's actually more um it's well structured like it's yeah. it's not dramatically changing like the film is always the same but it is shifting gears but it's doing it in such a way that you you still to a certain extent have to say okay We're opening with this massively bombastic opening sequence, blood, gore, you know, people cutting, all this kind of stuff. And then you have to be willing to go along for the really slow middle part where there's very little action happening. Mm -hmm. And if you can't stay on board with this film, you're going to lose a lot of the emotional resonance that comes with the end. Yeah. And I think also because it... it, Instead of being a secret rape revenge film, it's kind of a secret torture porn film because it does, the film does save that for the last half of the movie. Well, okay. So this is where I'm maybe just going to briefly interject with one of our uh, source materials. So I went back to our good friend Alex West from Faculty of Horror, mm-hmm. and she briefly talked about the the interesting timeline that this film Uh, adopts so she says what it does is that we're actually seeing the effects of violence in reverse so the audience experiences what these women have in reverse the beginning of the film deals with the aftermath of trauma the midsection deals directly with the trauma and the final third deals with the initial capture and torture Um. and i thought that was so interesting like i'd never actually thought of the film in that way but it's 100 percent accurate right like we're actually seeing the reverse of what this all produces that actually so i i'll I'll just do my one quick quote i I found one um it's um by daniel totaro from may 2009 it's uh it's from an article titled martyrs evoking france's cinematic and historical past but what he said was martyrs provides none of the usual payoff or catharsis common to the torture subgenre like you would see in hostile or saw and that makes sense with what you just said because the catharsis is in the beginning ish Mm -hmm. if you when she kills his family and then it goes in reverse that's also why it, it feels so I think that's why I felt so empty afterwards, because, yeah, it ends with with the beginning, basically. Absolutely. And even though the ending is beautiful, and to a certain extent, Mm -hmm. we get peace for these characters, that's not... I don't want to say it's not satisfying, because it actually really is, but on the same... At the same time... It's not the norm. It's heavy, right? Yeah, it's not how... What what we are used to seeing in film. Like, and and that's also why I like this, because it's not what I'm used to seeing. In more ways than one. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah. So, this is Lucy. She's played by Mylène Jean-Panois. And, uh, yeah. So, she thinks that these Belfon assholes are the people who abducted and tortured her as a kid. 
So, at this point, she's distraught. She's still very paranoid. So she calls Anna, played by Mojanois Alanois. Who is just eating a sandwich in her car, happy as a clam. She's literally just hanging out, waiting to hear from her friend. And I say friend in quotation marks. Yeah. Yeah. We'll get there. <laughs> so, yeah, we'll get there. So while she waits, Lucy is attacked by the same monster from her childhood. So she hides in the closet. She remembers part of her torture as a child. And we'll get these kind of flashbacks throughout the second part of the film. Eventually, she escapes into the yard. And this is where she runs into Anna, who has discovered the bodies inside. And she tends to Lucy's wounds because Lucy has... Uh, you know, she's she's gotten in a bunch of scrapes from this monster. Yeah, and this is also when we learn, like, oh, obviously, yeah, this is why Lucy's doing this, because she thinks they're the ones that tortured her as a child. But then it's also where we get the doubt, where it's like, Anna's like, are you sure? Like, mm-hmm. you didn't, like, you were supposed to, like, case, case them out, not just walk in and kill them. And so, of course, the, a good, probably the next, like, 15 to 20 minutes is spent with this back and forth of like Anna doubting Lucy and like not sure what's going on, but she loves her so much. She wants to help her. Yes. And really this is the foundation of these first two thirds of the film, which Mm. is this relationship between the two girls, which began in childhood has survived all of these years. And I mean, I, I see a bunch of people say, Oh, it's just that it's, uh, you know, they're really good friends, but this is also the moment where as they're dragging the bodies into the bathroom, Anna kisses Lucy. And to me, as a queer viewer, yeah, maybe this is just a kiss like, hey, you know, it's just something that I'm doing to reassure you or something that I can use to express our connectedness. But to me, this is like, Anna is doing this because she is literally in love with Lucy. Yes. Like, and, and But Lucy recoils. Like, Lucy does not reciprocate. Lucy does not reciprocate. No. Yeah. No. Which I don't, I mean, who? maybe this is a contentious statement, so I can edit it out if it is, but I don't think that Lucy, with the trauma that she has, even if she did, doesn't kill herself later, would ever be in a position to be ready for any kind of romantic or sexual relationship uh, anytime soon. I don't think that's controversial. We're, it's really unclear whether or not Lucy got any kind of psychiatric help. Mm-hmm. You know, we saw her withdrawing from people we saw her disconnecting from people in the footage the camcorder footage from 1971 and i think we're meant to infer that yeah she was probably seeing psychiatrists or she was probably speaking to somebody but we don't actually know that for sure and the way that she reacts like she is still so inside her own head it like she is disconnected from everything except her trauma so absolutely i don't think she would be in a position where she could reciprocate this and I'll save it for the discussion, but with Lucy, with Anna's queerness, I actually have a way on how that reads into the ending of the film that yeah. I came up myself and I felt really proud of this. Okay, I'm excited. Mm-hmm. Okay. So that night, Anna discovers that the matriarch, Gabriel, Patricia Tulasne, is still alive. Lucy <laughs> I thought you, is a tech. <laughs> I thought you were saying Patricia Tulas names, and I was like, okay, no, that's cool. <laughs> I couldn't bother to pronounce them, so I just said there are two. That's fine. (laughs) I love it. Lucy is attacked again, resulting in another flashback, and she remembers escaping from Gabrielle and discovering another girl. And it turns out that this is the girl who has been attacking her in a nearby cell. Literally the ghost of her guilt from leaving this woman. Yes. Like manifesting in this creature. Mm -hmm. so when she's being attacked lucy sees this creature this woman who she had to leave behind in order to survive but Mm -hmm. of course what is actually happening is that she is self-harming under the guise of her trauma and i I mean i saw this movie you know 11 years ago for the first time i just remember like because the way it because like because anna never sees the creature no um she always sees the aftermath and so when lucy's in the hallway like because she says, like, I'm sorry, like, I finally did it, I got them. And, like, the creature comes up and, like, touches her. And mm-hmm. and you think, oh, it's fine. And then she starts slashing her and, like, bashing her head against the wall, which that actually was harder for me to watch than the actual slicing. Oh, yeah. But Anna comes around the corner and just sees Lucy doing this to herself. And the way that Loger shoots this, specifically with, like, the hands coming up around her head, is really, really cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah. A little bit grudgy, in a way. But uh, no, it, it, it did. I mean, it, 
yeah, actually, Juon would have come out before this. But yeah, it did remind me of the shower and the grudge. Yeah. Okay, so before we get to Lucy's departure, back in the present, Lucy discovers that Gabrielle is still alive. And I... No, I'll say that until we talk about the remake, but it's just another example um, how... <laughs> little effort the remake put in but yeah so lucy discovers that gabrielle is still alive she bludgeons her to death with a mallet over anna's protests and she then accuses anna of not believing her and she proceeds to like wreck the joint and this might be part of the unrated did you did, do you know if your streaming one was unrated or was it rated r i think i had the rated or the unrated sorry there is a shot when she first hits her with the mallet it is like a split second shot of her head with the first blow. And it's just her, sorry, sorry of her face, not just her head, her face. And it mm-hmm. is like, I pause it to be like, ooh. <laughs> like, it's rough. That is rough. And then, of course, yeah, she just like mutilates her skull with this mallet. It goes on for so much longer than I remembered. I thought she whacked her maybe once or twice. She whacks her like, probably 10 times. <laughs> well, and this is the catharsis that we get, though, because cause at this point, we. Well, actually, no, we don't. No, know. we don't. Yeah. We, I, we, I think, because at this point, we see Anna questioning her, we are also questioning her. And because, really, we've only seen Lucy barrel in the door and shoot this family of people who seem like just regular people, I think we're really meant to believe, oh, my God, this woman is crazy and she has just killed this family for no reason that's th- i think that's another reason why to this movie again it it works but it's also so troubling is because so yes we get the moment of catharsis but we don't know it we don't until, know it <laughs> until until after lucy is dead yeah and so yeah, we, we don't even get the earned satisfaction of her knowing that it was correct you know I mean, I think she knew it was correct, but right. she doesn't get the benefit of Anna's yeah. confirmation, right? Yeah. It's yeah, yeah it, it's the way that they like I mean, it it's clear that Loger was not in the right state of mind <laughs> when he was doing all this. Oof. Oh boy. I I'm glad that he had people who were helping him to pour his his own issues into a productive piece of creative art. Yes. <laughs> yeah okay so at this point lucy discovers that she is still being haunted so as you suggested this creature is still kicking around and she bangs her head against the wall she cuts her own wrists and she ends up committing suicide essentially i did mark a comment in my notes about how this i mean it's a, it might be a simplistic viewing of like you know her killing herself but because it's like you know okay well she's finally accomplished this why does she then just kill herself um, obviously it's cause like she's, she doesn't get this, the piece out of it, you know, but it's also kind of a commentary on how, like, if you're looking forward to something like, like remember when you're a kid and you're looking forward to Christmas and like, that's what you're looking forward to all December and like you're getting the gifts. And then all of a sudden it's December 26th and Christmas is over and you have nothing to look forward to anymore. It's yeah. like that sense of deflation where you're like, Oh, I don't know. That, that's, that's kind of how I read it. Obviously this is a more extreme version of that, but that's just kind of how I felt because we're, we're so much of life is, is, um, looking forward to something and so once you pass that day actually all right it reminds me of this moment in deep blue sea when uh, <laughs> <laughs> when saffron burrow says you wait your whole life for a single moment and then one day it's tomorrow yeah. and it's like oh yep that's true <laughs> yeah i think that combined with the fact that it has not it has not eased her guilt like she doesn't yeah. feel any better because she still let that girl die yeah, Which is and, terrible. Like, she did not have a responsibility to save that girl. She only had a responsibility to save herself. Mm-hmm. But that doesn't make it easier for her to deal with. Yes. Yeah. I, uh, oh. Oh, and also, watching her slit both of her wrists with those scissors was uncomfortable. That was harder than the uh, the throat slash for me. Like it, it, it focuses on her going up her arm. Not quickly. It's quite slow. <laughs> it's so fucking slow. Yeah. Um, um, and this is, uh, listeners, by the way, the 45 minute mark. So the movie is effectively halfway over by this point. Which is crazy because you, at this point, one of our two leads is dead. Mm-hmm. I have no idea where this movie is going now. It's okay. So I actually did clock this. So the first act is 45 minutes long. The second act is 13 minutes long. And then the third act is the remaining, like, 30, 35 minutes. It feels... I I often feel like this middle section drags a little bit. I disagree. But I think it's just because you really... I think it's because I don't know what's happening. 
Mm-hmm. Like, oh, yeah, this is sure. this is the film resetting itself. And I'm like, wait, what is happening? And mm-hmm. it, it's just like by the time you get to the third act, you know exactly where this film is fucking going. Oh, and 100 <laughs> percent. Like, <laughs> Yeah. OK, so well on the phone with her unsupportive mother, Anna discovers a hidden compartment leading to a basement laboratory replete with pictures of women being abused on the walls and a padlocked hatch leading to a sub-basement torture room. There she discovers an emaciated, badly scarred woman who is not actually named in the credits, but is named by the Mademoiselle as Sarah Dutroit, and she is played by Emily Mastige. And this woman has a drilled-in headplate and a metal cod piece, and oh my god, it I, is the stuff of fucking nightmares. It's and there is a moment. So whenever Anna finds her, she holds her hand, and mm. it's one of the few like I don't want to say peaceful moments in the film because you're still like, what the fuck is going on? It's tender. Yes, it's like this moment of human kindness that the film doesn't showcase a lot. Yeah, and at this point, you really get the sense that, okay, even if you want to disagree with us that Anna had romantic feelings for Lucy, she is so obviously a motherly figure. Mm -hmm. Like, she is so caring and compassionate because she sees this woman, she's not even really horrified, she's just immediately trying to take care of her. And I did see reviews that were like, when this happens, why doesn't she call the police and leave? Why, why, Why does she try to, well, do what she's about to do? And I'm just like... What what would you like? <laughs> what would you do? And when we talk about the American remake, they actually try to address that complaint by doing it, and then it's really wonky and weird with the explanation mm-hmm. of what it does. But, yeah. um, but yeah. So yeah. So Anna brings this woman upstairs. She bathes her. She removes the pins in her head so that the head plate can be taken mm. off. <laughs> this is probably the hardest scene for me to watch. It really is. It's it's reminiscent. I mean, I guess this came. No, this no, this came after the. So it's the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the beginning, whenever Leatherface pulls off Matt Bomer's face, and it's <laughs> it's when there's goo like sticking from the skull to the skin. So when she yeah. pulls off this visor, it like there's like like mucusy sinew goo like just stuck, <laughs> and it looks so disgusting it is terrible yeah and we're alternating between the really slow removal of these pins using a screwdriver like a flathead screwdriver to this woman screaming as blood pours through the face mask and through her mouth and oh it's yeah if you do not handle torture and gore this is really tough well, to watch. And that's the thing, though. Th- this isn't even torture. This is, I mean, not, mm-hmm. it, it is hurting this woman, clearly, because she's crying out for help as this is happening. Because yeah. she, she, she can't see what's happening. Like, she, she, her eyes are covered by the, oh, by the visor. Terrifying. Oh, it's so terrifying. But when she pulls out the first staple, like, there's, like, drips of blood that come out. The effects work in this film is, like, oh, so amazing. Good. It's so yeah. good. It's, but that's also what makes it so hard to watch. Yeah. Yeah, because it it feels so visceral, and we'll mm-hmm. get to that in a minute. Yep. Okay, so at this point, Anna obviously realizes that Lucy was fucking right the whole time, and she actually goes to Lucy's corpse, and she apologizes for not believing her. And mm-hmm. I think that is our moment of catharsis, but you're right, it's it's too late. Yeah, right? it, it's not the expected moment of catharsis that you would get from a normal film. Yeah. Or a conventional film, I guess. <laughs> yeah. The next morning, Sarah attempts to slit her wrists, and she accosts Anna in the process. And before we can even address that, Sarah is suddenly shot in the head as members of the cult arrive to secure the scene. Well, Sarah and the... Go ahead. I would say this is the beginning of what I perceive to be the third act. Mm Mm-hmm. Like, what, once Sarah gets her head blown out, like, that's done. 13 minutes of a second act, and then boom, here we have the end of the movie. That's stretched out for 35 minutes. (laughs) Yeah, you could maybe argue that it's all the way up until Anna is properly locked in the room is still part of the second act. But it's like, "Mm, that's, you know, six of one, half a dozen of the other. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So while Sarah and the Belford's bodies are dumped in the hole in the backyard, Anna is handcuffed and educated by Mademoiselle Catherine Begin. 
about the process of suffering. So she talks to her about their their historical legacy of trying to find martyrs as opposed to victims, because victims are common, martyrs are rare, and of course, they are always women. And you could argue that this exposition dump, because that's all it is, is unnecessary, because I don't think they gave this explanation to anyone else <laughs> they had kidnapped before. So it's like, uh... why, why give this to her but i don't care i disagree i think that they do this because they're trying to make sure that the girls understand why they are made to suffer in the hopes that it will help them to transcend well and this is when she says i i love this woman playing mademoiselle i, I think she's mm, like a, mm-hmm. a, a creepy malig- malicious figure oh she's hugely compelling this is when and we'll talk about this later when we get to this the themes but she says Young women, young girls are yeah. more susceptible to martyrdom. So, of course, this is a movie. They only go after girls. And this yeah. is where your accusations of misogyny can come in. Whereas I say, like, hey, let's go back to all of our slasher history with Carol Clover talking about final girls and why we always have to use final girls as the source of suffering so that they can grab the phallus and overcome and all this kind of stuff like we want to play fast and loose with this like we love final girls but apparently when we present it in this other way which is more realistic and damaging all of a sudden then it becomes misogynistic well i just viewed it more as like even just the statement is like it's young women is like oh like they're closer to god in a way like women are more holy than men that's how i viewed it yeah yeah uh yeah i'm sure we'll have more to say in a yeah for sure so anna is then locked up downstairs and time passes this is the part where i think if you are not on board of this film oh this, you're done <laughs> this is excruciating so this is the 68 minute mark and it goes on for about 15 minutes yeah so we watch as anna is fed gruel she is beaten and her head is shaved and over time anna just becomes increasingly less responsive she's never really she only ever tries to fight back once it doesn't go well but they expect they they make her like because he like waits by the door and like waits for her to make a run for it and then also like he i think he like he does something to like instigate her to like hit him back and that just makes it worse for her Hmm. yeah 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 uh as we discussed during the hostile 2 episode really if you think about it this is torture for the purposes of breaking someone down it's a power dynamic they are trying to break her in a sense right yeah so at a certain point she becomes less afraid and uh she has reached the second last stage so there's only one stage left this woman who has been feeding her caresses her I guess we didn't really say exactly what they were doing, but yeah, they, they're trying to basically make them see the afterlife, like torturing them into a point of submission to where they are so close to death that they actually do see something in the afterlife. Yes, but they can still report back because they're not quite dead. Right. So this cult just wants to know what's what's afterlife. Mm-hmm. It's the... <laughs> it's so white privilege I can't <laughs> even with it. Like, we've got nothing better to do except torture girls to find out what awaits us in the afterlife. <laughs> like, get a hobby! <laughs> I found a lot of readings about white privilege. Because also, we didn't mention that Lucy actually is a person of color. Um, she's played by an uh, I, I mean, Asian descent of some sort actress yeah her mom was chinese and actually uh the actress who plays anna is of moroccan descent oh well there you go but yeah there's also a lot of readings in this film about elitism and like you know the one mm-hmm. percent and like using the poor as products and things like that oh yes yes and that ties into uh into pascal Loger's catholicism as well yeah Okay, so Anna is caressed by this woman. She's informed that there's only one stage left. She's then brought into another room, locked into a machine, hung upside down, and flayed. This is actually, too, the one scene in the remake that is more gory than the original. Correct. Because you don't actually, you don't see the flaying happen in the original. You just see the aftermath, which is horrific. Yeah. So in this version, we focus entirely on Anna's face Mm -hmm. as she writhes in pain. And then we see the aftermath where basically all that is left of her skin is the skin on her face. So the entirety of her body is now Hellraiser Frank 
completely skinless. Minus the face, which I thought was an interesting touch to leave the face, but... It's because it keeps her human. Got it. There you go. So, uh, yeah, so then she is left. And this is the only point in this final section, like this is where the where the transition kind of occurs. Up until this point, we haven't been entirely in Anna's headspace. So the camera has been focused on her face. It's been cutting off her attackers in terms of like the way the camera is framed mm-hmm. or the actors are positioned. And at this point, we actually cut upstairs to just see this woman making a fucking smoothie. And this other guy comes in and they look so normal and Mm -hmm. just so casual. And the guy's just like, hey, I think she's totally ready. And she's she's completely transformed. So So I thought she was actually making the slop. She is making the slop, but it like. Like just but, yeah. making it using a blender, like it looks like a Sunday morning smoothie. <laughs> no, it, 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 yeah, it, it's like a day by day slice of life of just a regular white American or white French household. <laughs> American. <Yep. laughs> <laughs> so we cut back to Anna. The camera pushes in on her vacant eye, and we get this this slightly longer than I remembered look at this cosmic afterlife, which is lights and imagery. And at this point, we also get to hear Lucy whispering stuff about how she can let go and she can mm-hmm. accept it. Oh, well, that's the thing, though. So, like, with all these, this, oh, because we, we did skip over this bit. So, yeah, Lucy, you know, her ghost, like, what what's left over from her trauma is, like, the ghost of this woman that she left behind. Um, with the one with the visor, her ghost is that she keeps seeing cockroaches crawl over her body. Yes. Um, Anna's ghost is Lucy. And yeah. rather than an agent of pain, she actually pushes her towards martyrdom. Right. And, and this peace. is why Anna is able to, quote unquote, survive. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So this is the end. Mademoiselle arrives. She asks if Anna has seen the other world. She bends down and Anna whispers something to her. And in case you were wondering, even if you have the subtitles on, no, you will not get any dialogue here. (laughs) So a large group of individuals arrives at the house to listen to Anna's story. We are told that she is the fourth person to reach the stage, but only the first to describe it. And Mademoiselle's second-in-command, Etienne, Jean-Marie Monsela, inquires of Mademoiselle she is ready to address the crowd. And she's on the other side of the bathroom wall, and she just says, keep doubting. And then she shoots herself in the head. And at this point, we get the definition, as you indicated earlier, we get the definition of murder, according to the Merriam-Webster Dictionary. And there is a slow final push in on Anna's still alive, flayed body before the credits play over camcorder footage of Anna and Lucy as girls. I actually don't know if it's a Merriam-Webster Dictionary definition, uh, but yeah, it just says that martyr also is witness, which... I just, I mean, again, I didn't do a lot of research I, on that specific thing, but um, I Googled it and like, Martyr wasn't pulling up witness for any definition, but it was like from, it was going from the Greek definition of like where Martyr comes from or something. I can see it in a particularly religious connotation as well, because if you think of somebody uh, like Joan of Arc as a martyr, right. where she was getting visions from God and she ultimately gets burned at the stake for it. Mm-hmm. You know, she's very much a witness to things. You know, we talked about this a little bit with Cassandra from our Scream 2 episode as well, where Cassandra had visions of the future, but no one would believe her. But she was a witness to things to come. And her penance was that no one would ever take her seriously. Yeah. So that is murders. Um, yeah. It's... Who wants yeah. to take a bath? <laughs> I know. I, it's, I mean, I've literally never had a, a film affect me like, like this one has. I mean, maybe if we ever watch Solo or whatever, like I'll feel the same way. But I haven't seen Solo, um, which is a Criterion film. It's true. Yeah. <laughs> it's on the list. <laughs> so, okay. I mean, I, the, the themes that I pulled, I pulled just the overall concept of the film was torture porn. Um, the meaning of martyrs with the witness stuff. My queer reading, and um, there's elitism, and um, the ending explained, which I thought was a really cool thing, too. Right. Okay. Shall we take it from the top? I guess torture porn. Okay. So, I will reference um, an AV Club article that I found on the film, written by Scott Tobias. Okay. The explicitness of Anna's torture and martyrdom, a demonstration of female strength and resilience that's meant 
as a suspect type of feminism, has more in common with real institutional forms of torture and human experimentation, and is conducted with an emotional distance that's infinitely more disturbing and terrible. On some level, Martyrs feels like a comment on other films of its kind, because it shuts down any notion that pleasure could be derived from watching it. It feels like the death of extreme horror, or at least takes the subgenre as far as it can conceivably go. And that goes back to our hostel episode really is like, you know, what is torture porn? Because it, it implies that someone is getting off by watching yeah. this. And this movie is like, no, that's not what's happening here. Well, there's also nothing sexualized about mm -hmm. this torture, right? Like, it's really important. I really wanted to emphasize the fact that they are not they are not sexually assaulting these girls. Not that that makes it any better, <laughs> but it doesn't make it worse. No, but it's, you know, it's not the kind of thing where, like, when you watch Hostel, you can tell that the reason that people are participating in that club mm -hmm. is because they are trying to fulfill some kind of need in their life, and they feel like the only way they can get it is by exerting this power over other people. But there is, like, a sexual fetishization that's happening there. Here... That's not what this is about. This is a religious order, right? right? Like, they are literally trying to see the afterlife with these girls. And the torture is just the method by which they're going to get there. Mm -hmm. Now, that doesn't make it easier to watch. No. And I do think it's important, though, also to acknowledge the fact that Pascal Loger has said he made this film as conversation to hostile. So this film comes out in the wake of Hostel and Hostel Part 2. Yeah, no, it, it comes out, uh, it, it is screened at Cannes almost a full year after Hostel 2 came out. Okay, so this is his take on the idea of torture porn, but he has explicitly said that he didn't want to deal with the torture, he wanted to deal with the suffering. Um, I, th I think that... The 15-minute torture sequence, obviously that's the biggest issue people issue people have with the film, where they're like, why? Why can't you skip over that and just tell us? Why do you have to show us that? I would mm -hmm. argue that you do have to show us this, because not only is, is the film beating Anna into submission, but it's also beating... Beating us, us into, us submission. into submission. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, whereas I can see how someone would... I mean, again, like we talked about Heather Matarazzo's death in Hostel 2, which I, I do think is very disturbing, but there's also something like beautiful about it like the way it's shot and framed nothing about this is beautiful this is yeah. all horrific gross and ugly mm -hmm. and that I, I actually think that is a more effective way of dealing with this and it's just a torture film i would never call this torture porn yeah um i do have a quote from pascal loger from so this is a, a quote that's captured in the chapter on martyrs in alex west's book the new french extremity and he says i really wanted to give answers to the audience for the amount of violence i was putting them through i am not the kind of guy who can show very brutal sequences without a reason behind it it wasn't a matter of self-justification because i hate that it was more a way of helping to relieve the audience to give the audience a reason to stay in the theater believe it or not i didn't make the film to shock or create any sort of scandal i wrote the film in a very sincere state of mind i was feeling pain and i wanted the audience to share that pain as part of a very honest process i wasn't aware at the time that i wrote it that i was crossing any lines i was thinking i'm going to make the audience feel the real pain and i i would argue that he does and i'm not saying that you should want that and that you like it's a good thing to feel but if you're going to watch a horror movie or something like this, it, 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 it accomplishes what it sets out to do. And I do think that viewing it as like uh, exploitative is doing this a disservice. Okay, so I've got some other stuff that I think could maybe help to contextualize this because I don't want to diminish people's discomfort right. or their struggle if they try to watch this and they're just like, you know what, I can't. So part of this is that what I want to try to encourage people to do is dissociate the discomfort from something like, oh, this is a claim of misogyny, because I think that those are two very, very different kinds of arguments. So I'm going to reference the introduction from a book called The New Extremism in Cinema by Tanya Horick and Tina Kendall. And this is a really interesting book because it addresses this rise in extremism in film and it starts in France and then it actually documents a transition across European cinema. 
So they're not actually looking specifically just at films of the new extreme, but they're looking at it as like part of a larger movement. And one of the things that they're really interested in is how much emotion and like a physical reaction to watching these films is part of the intended process. So these films situate sex and violence as a means of interrogating the relationship between films and their spectators in the late 20th and early 21st centuries. In their concerted practice of provocation as a mode of address, these films of the new extremism bring the notion of response to the fore, interrogating challenging and often destroying the notion of a passive or disinterested spectator so right off the bat what horrick and kendall are saying here is that these films are deliberately trying to get a rise out of you so pascal loger said that he didn't do this to upset people Mm -hmm. but he is trying to get people to feel something so if we take that the next step further, many of them tend to represent subjects, rape, necrophilia, self-mutilation, bashing, slashings, blindings, hard-ons, cannibalism, sadomasochism, incest, through techniques that heighten the sensory and affective involvement of audiences, foregrounding the question of spectatorial response in a way that unites the intellectual and the visceral. So, in a sense... They're a form of embodied dialogue that takes place between film, spectator, and context. So what they're really trying to get you to do is the films want you to have this dialogue about your position as a spectator while you're watching these films. So you can't be passive. You can't just watch Martyrs and be like, that was a movie I watched. It's like, you have to feel it. Like, you have to be grossed out. You have to be upset. You have to be even disinterested or angry, right? So they call for a sustained consideration of the complex relations between aesthetics and politics as they're constructed through dialogue between the film and the spectator. And then they're reproduced and reconfigured through the vociferous public debates that these films tend to leave in their wake. So the power of the film becomes not just in the filmmaking process or the watching and the reacting, but also then the debate that we have about the film Mm -hmm. and that's where the power lies well yeah this is a film that you want to discuss afterwards and it's no matter how you feel about it it is a film that will stick with you i mean you will feel something oh yeah after watching this film and uh, granted i've seen a wide range I, i saw a review that referred to it as boring specifically in the torture section saying this isn't entertaining or involving it's just boring and i was like i mean guess what i don't think the movie is trying to be entertaining in no, no no no, no, no. Like, I, mean, I get that but, but i thought i was like boring is an interesting word to use for for some of this movie um but no, I, I, mean, but- I could even see like monotony because really it's like you're really just living with the torture with Mm -hmm. anna day in and day out for all of these days like we don't even know how much time is passing no and it does does become it does become repetitive and it does become terrifying in just its abjectness right but that's the purpose i do like i did a bullet list of just what she goes through and i was like okay cool slop she spits it up and gets a slap then she pees in her bucket through the chair hole because she has a chair hole um Mm -hmm. a a man unchains her and beats the fuck out of her then she gets a haircut then there's more beatings then there's a sponge bath then there's more beatings then she sees lucy and accepts her life then there's slop then there's more beatings like (laughs) it's like it's that that's what we're going through and you know it's not good like you're not gonna feel good watching this but no it's meant to be hard yes and loger if he just wants to inspire a feeling that that is done with with all of this yeah and that that i think is why you end this film feeling a little bit dead inside and a little Mm -hmm. bit like wow i'm just exhausted by this process but think about it like you introduce this episode by saying that no film has ever made you feel the way that you did when you first saw it. Mm -hmm. And that is powerful. It is. You know, it's not good per se, but you can't say that this film doesn't leave an impact. Well, and and that's why though, to me, this is a five out of five film. It's not one that I want to rewatch often or ever really. (laughs) But, and and that's why when I quoted Perry, again, I'm, I think Nemi Roth, but whoops saying like, I hate this film, but I don't think it's a bad one. And I think it's like, I hate that this film makes me feel this way. And that, again, that is the power of cinema and one of the only instances to, like, make me feel this. And it's just, like, that it does that. I was like, that, I mean, it's art. 
it is art and it's powerful and that something is has that much of an effect on me i was like that deserves five stars for me no matter what even if i don't really enjoy the experience yeah so next topic Maybe we'll do the the elitism and kind of stuff. And this can be a shorter conversation just because I, I think it's important to touch on. Yep. Um, so this is um, from an article called Keep Doubting Why Martyrs is One of Horror's Most Biting Critiques on Systems of Violence and Oppression. Mm-hmm. So basically, when Anna's getting tortured, uh, it's Angie is the author. There's no other credit. Um, mm, Angie, okay. Angie writes, this process of torture becomes a way that Anna can prove her usefulness to the elite. And in this way, via treating her body as a product or a commodity... Anna's torture is akin to slavery. Her body and personhood isn't of use until the elite can profit from its production. And in her final moments, Anna's ultimate sacrifice and assimilation comes from not only the removal of the physical traits that mark her as other or brown or minority, but from her body providing a good to her abusers. She literally becomes a product. And so she posits that the film points a mirror at the viewer, which is also what makes the film so uncomfortable to watch. She says... We like to point fingers and accuse the 1% of terrible deeds. But what makes us better than the elite? In reality, nothing. Our moral compass is no better. We buy fast fashion. We buy fast fashion shirts and tops so cheap that we can only surmise that they are produced in overseas sweatshops. We purchase chocolate from companies that publicly face accusations of engaging in modern day slavery. We hear stories of young girls being sold into sex trafficking and continue to vacation and spend our dollars in areas known for such atrocities. And just as in the film, many of these horrors disproportionately impact women of color. In Martyrs, Logier forces us to engage with suffering in a very direct and personal manner. We become martyrs of a different sort, the ones who see and bear witness yet do nothing yeah i think that's also what makes it hard to watch but i think that's not something that you think about or realize when you're watching it no i think that's one of those it's been a week i'm still thinking about this Mm -hmm. oh fuck yeah i'm complicit in part of this right Mm -hmm. yeah alex west has a, a piece about that as well so she talks about how he sets this potentially nihilistic film against the clean stainless steel backdrop of the upper middle class bourgeois family who also happen to be part of a network that destroys young women as a perverted means of affirming the existence of an afterlife the antagonists are clean well-dressed educated elite who brutally torture innocent subjects with the same clinical organization they utilize to maintain their immaculate homes and they're all white i don't think there's a single person of color they in this cult. all fucking white and like i don't think Okay, people sometimes accuse us of reaching. Yeah. Guess what? It was not a mistake to cast two, like... Women of color. Two women of color, two other minority figures in this film against a sea of white, rich people. Rich white people. It's totally intentional. It It is totally intentional. And, okay, okay, that really makes me want to go into the queer stuff then, because that's another thing. So that makes Anna other... Mm-hmm. So, okay, so I found this quote, and it made me think about how to read how to read Anna's queerness into the end of the film in a positive light. And maybe this, this can be a discussion. So okay. this is um, Andrew Cousins uh, in The Philosophy of Martyrs, Transcendence, and Torture. And he writes, Lucy is the cause Anna has that allows her to accept the suffering she is put under. While the others had antagonistic visions, Anna's is of someone she loves and accepts. One would assume that a pious, religious martyr would have visions of their deity. By accepting rather than fighting the vision, the victim becomes a martyr. So I took that. Just thinking about, I was like, yeah, because like when you think of a martyr, you think, oh, someone who dies for their religious beliefs. Yeah. And I've said this before. I grew up very Catholic. Um, my mother like went to Catholic, like, nun- Catholic school where the nuns beat you with rulers in Beckwoods, Louisiana. And like, I was Jesus just like, Christ. I went through confirmation. I did all this shit. Like, I mean, I am a familiar with Catholicism, you could say. Mm-hmm. So I thought about this. And I was like, okay, the deity. I think she doesn't have a vision of her deity because as all of us know, most religions view homosexuality or queerness as a sin. It is mm-hmm. a mortal sin. You're going to hell, blah, 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 blah. But she's the one to experience this, to witness the afterlife. And of course, we don't know what she sees. But I think that she doesn't have a vision of her deity because she believes that her deity has rejected her. She's gay or queer in some way. You know, we don't label her. Yeah. That's why she doesn't see a deity. At least I don't think she does. And it's her love for a woman, for her friend, that she is held onto that allows her to become a martyr. So in a sense, it is her queerness that allows her this privilege, if you will, to sneak a peek into the afterlife while still being alive. Oh, that's so sweet. I, I and I, 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 again, I, 
I have not seen this reading anywhere, so if anyone else has had it, I apologize, but I'm co-opting it. <laughs> because mm-hmm. that that's I think that's a positive way to look at this in the sense that, you know, her queerness is what allows her to do this. And maybe that you could view that as bad because it's like, well, that sucks, though, because <laughs> then it like justifies all the torture she went through. But I, I don't think that's what it's I, that's not how I read it. I mean, I guess it justifies it for the cult, but it's just something that allows her an extra level of existence of insight that mm-hmm. her straight counterparts who get horrible visions and don't have kindness like that, yeah. that's an interesting way of looking at it. It's like, hey, like the people that aren't queer, they get fucked up the most. Whereas queerness, maybe even growing up queer and suffering enough like your whole life, that's why she has happiness when she's going through the worst things in her life. Like, Yeah, she's been suffering the whole fucking time. Mm-hmm. But she's also been suffering internally her whole life. Yeah. I really like that because I've seen a couple of other people talk about how Anna's love for Lucy is the thing that ends up getting her into this position. And even OJ himself says, you know, oh, it's, you know, it's this, this love for the wrong person that gets you into trouble and how if she hadn't loved Lucy, then she wouldn't have fallen into the situation. I just thought that is so fucking dark because it not only suggests had she not loved lucy she would have been safe but also like there's a certain condemnation then of queerness right well that's going back to our hostile 2 episode where i brought up bj colangelo's criticism of that film where it's like well none of that movie would have happened if beth wasn't queer and fallen for the honeypot xl exactly and i I get it again if you look at this film as conversation with hostile part two and part one Mm -hmm. like hello rich meaningful dialogue that we're having Yeah. No, I, mean, I understand that reading. I don't subscribe to it. I don't believe that because, again, I mean, if it was a straight person, it'd be the same fucking thing. Well, and I think even if you do believe that idea, like, okay, whatever. I mean, guess what? If Anna wasn't there, we wouldn't have a movie. But also, okay, fine. Fine. I'll go along with this idea. You know what? Shit. It would have been so much better for her if she hadn't have fallen into this trap. But then if we subscribe to your reading, it gives it this happier alternative where Mm -hmm. she does find peace she does find happiness and satisfaction and it's only because of her love for lucy that she manages to achieve that state at the end of this film exactly that's beautiful yeah and it's i mean like again it doesn't make me happier about her fate but (laughs) no but 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 it gives me a sense of peace though knowing that she's at peace or at least believing because you can also watch this and not believe that she's at peace because again we don't know what she says to mademoiselle whether it's truth or lie or whether it's good or bad oh yeah like anna is effectively mute as of the entire last act of this film we never hear her speak again i like to believe that she's trolling mademoiselle and just tells her something that she knows is gonna like make her want to kill herself (laughs) Okay, well, maybe that's a good transition into what the fuck is the meaning of the end of this film? What do people think? Okay, so I got another quote, and I actually really like this one because it puts the movie in a new context for me that um, goes with um, spoiler culture for today. Hmm. Um, Okay, so this is um, from thisberry.com. Oh, this is, I love it. Martyrs, movie plot ending explained is the name of the article. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> oh, my favorite. I know. I had no hopes reading this, but here's the thing. All right. So they mentioned, like, uh, imagine, like, The Sixth Sense comes out. Someone tells you the ending. Well, do you want to go see it now? No. You're like, well, I already know the ending. What am I going to do? Imagine you're going to Vegas, and someone tells you, hey, you actually are not going to win anything today. Okay, cool. You're not going to want to go to the casino. So this person, who is not credited, writes, life, in a sense, comes with a twist at the end. Death. Many cultures believe that the purpose of life is revealed in the afterlife, but what if it is the suspense presented by life that gives us all a purpose to live each day? If the suspense was removed, then suddenly there would no longer be the urge to live. We will never know what Anna's whispers were, but whatever it was, it leaves Mademoiselle with a knowledge that removes her purpose to live. She doesn't want to give out the information to the society, as that will only lead to more suicides. I don't really know if I buy into that, but whatever. Mm, yeah. um, the knowledge she has is overbearing and will most likely remove the will to live for everyone in the society, so she takes her life without disclosing the secret to life, universe, and everything. All she says is to keep doubting. Perhaps it's the doubt of the afterlife that keeps humans from killing themselves right away and cut to the chase. It's the doubt that gives our life purpose. Now, what I view this as, it's the ultimate spoiler warning. <laughs> 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 like, the, like what she's basically like spoils 
death for Mademoiselle, and that just re- like removes her will to live. And it just like because t- you know how people are so touchy with spoilers nowadays, like because with social media, like people will go and tweet the ending of Game of Thrones as soon as it ends, it's like saying, "Oh, like my- I can't believe this happened," and people get so fucking up in arms about it and like so pissy. Mm-hmm. And so this movie is like kind of like a like a microcosm of that entire spoiler culture to me. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> Well, interestingly enough, that also subscribes back to the way that you read why, in part, Lucy kills herself, right? She's yeah. accomplished her goal. She maybe doesn't see something else to live for. And you could say, maybe Mademoiselle feels the same, right? But I've seen people also speculate that it's like, oh, she she got notice of something that leads her to believe okay i want to go there right now so that's why she says i'm not even going to wait i'm just going to kill myself so i can get to that okay but see though she does wait because she does have a conversation with etienne before she kills herself so why why doesn't she tell them to you know uh i mean she always seemed like a bit of a selfish biddy to me (laughs) she's she's a selfish bitch no uh, what was your I mean, be, be it from this rewatch or from your first viewing of the film, what what did you make of it? Like, what do you think? And I don't know if it really is worth trying to serve, like, guess what oh, Anna told her. I have no interest in Yeah, I, I don't either. Any answer we get <laughs> is not going to be satisfactory. It's not going to satisfy. It's so much more interesting when we have to think about it for ourselves, and then we can have these debates, right? It's just another example of how the film wants you to keep talking about it and keep processing it. Yes, and it, it's not easy. It's not an easy conversation. And I think also what you take, like what what you whatever your view is of what she says or like what you take away from the ending, will also go into not only your religious beliefs but just who you are as a person. Like mm-hmm. your personality and who you are feeds into what you make of this ending and that also might be why some discussions are hard because you know I, i'm not a person to discuss religion or politics with people especially new people that i've met because it's just like or on yeah. social media because it's it's, it's, never... <laughs> it's gonna go badly <laughs> but th- those beliefs as political and religious ones are gonna feed your what you think of this ending and what you think is happening here. And I think that will also is what makes conversations hard because by talking about this movie with someone, you are indirectly giving away what your opinions are in politics and religion Hmm. without actually like having those conversations. Yeah. I mean, as someone who's not religious Mm -hmm. to me, the word choice, the doubt was always the most fascinating thing. It's not keep guessing. She's not suggesting, you know, haha, I know something and you don't. Right. She's not saying uh, keep striving, you know, it's keep doubting. Mm-hmm. Doubting of what, right? So I, I love that ambiguity and the oddness of that word choice. It's such a deliciously unusual choice. For of me. keep doubting? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, I remember watching this the first time and just thinking what the fuck is this like because really this film does not ever go where i think it's going to go no you know it, does not. it changes it changes structures three different times by the time you get to the torture you think okay i guess we're just gonna watch this girl get murdered that's not satisfying it, it is roughly a 15 minute torture sequence so it is lengthy of course it's nothing compared to what the actual timeline is <laughs> but no, yeah but just but it is it. roughly double what we watched with Heather Matarazzo, which is the longest yeah. torture sequence in Hostel. Yeah, exactly. Hostels. Hostels. Yeah. <laughs> Hostels. But really, at the end of the day, I mean, I love that this film ends on an extremely nihilistic ending. You know, all of the characters that we have watched, that we have grown to love and empathize, they're dead. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, like, if Anna's not dead, because I feel like she's still alive at the end of the film, but I desperately want her to die because that just seems like such a terrible state. Well, yeah, the last in. thing we have of Anna is she's fucking essentially crucified, skinless, and mm-hmm. martyring out. Yeah, and just, like, hanging out in the basement while all these rich white fuckers hang out and party upstairs. Oh, yeah, they're, they're literally, I think, are they holding champagne flutes? I think I they are. I think so, yeah. <laughs> oh, my so God. So fucked up. And if you can't read that that rich elitism reading into this, then I I can't even help you. <laughs> oh yeah, no. They're, what's an expensive champagne? Um, Cristal. They're, they're drinking Cristal. <laughs> <laughs> uh. Uh, but yeah, I mean the the fact that Mademoiselle just kills herself Mm -hmm. and that's the end of the film that's it i love it i mean i can't think of a better way to end a movie like this no and it's 
this might be a good transition to the end of the remake to have a small discussion about that um, before yeah. we close out. But no, I mean, like, I, I imagine, like, you're, this movie, the credits roll in this movie, and you were just sitting there, like, probably throughout the rest of the credits. Stunned. Taking this in. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. But. Okay. So, and then we get to revisit the whole shebang for 2015's Martyrs. The yep. remake. Which is a Blumhouse production. <laughs> oh my god. I had no idea. <laughs> I could not. When that came up, I just immediately went, wow, Weinsteins and Blumhouse again and again and again and again. <laughs> and what's funny is, though, while Martyrs, the original, doesn't have the traits you would normally see from a Weinstein film, uh, the remake does have the traits you would see from a Blumhouse film. It is directed by the Goetz brothers. I don't know who they are. Didn't uh, Y'all, we, we didn't do a lot of research on this. Like, Wait, no. What? Oh, I just said question mark. Like, who the fuck are these guys? I don't know. <laughs> Listeners, we didn't do a lot of um, research on this because we actually weren't planning on watching the remake. We just both happened to watch it without telling the other one. <laughs> so, again, this is going to be a brief... I was so curious. I just had to know. Well, and here's the thing. It is not as bad as you think it's going to be. And I, I don't think it's bad. It just it doesn't have the impact. It's it. There's less vo- violence and torture in it, which some would say defeats the purpose. Mm-hmm. And listeners, the, the big change that Mar- the remake makes is um, Lucy, played by Troy and Belisario, does not kill herself in this mo- in this version. And rather than finding a woman downstairs who has a metal visor and cod piece, they find a little girl who is not tortured. <laughs> She's just there. No. And it is about 15 minutes shorter than, than the original, and it r- really plays a factor in the first half. A lot of moments, um, like like... Lucy still asks the boy, like, how old are you? Do you know what your parents did? But it rushes through it. You don't really get that moment of, like, hesitation that you get in the original. So you lose a lot of beats that make the original so effective that the mm-hmm. this one just kind of skirts, skates by. Yeah, I think the thing that bothered me right off the bat was when Lucy kills both of the kids, you don't see the violence. So you yeah. hear her shoot the boy, and you it do cuts away. see his body briefly later on when he gets dumped into the pit. Mm-hmm. And she shoots the little girl under the bed, and you just see this puff of down comforter go up in the air. Mm-hmm. And then you see the girl's body in the pit later, and she literally does not have a scratch on her. Like, this is an American movie that is afraid to kill kids. I will say that I actually, I don't prefer the girl's death in the remake but i do like it because the way that this shot is done is yes yeah, she shoots her under the bed and she does hit her whereas in the original she doesn't hit her the girl crawls out she gets killed she gets shot but the camera is um panning overhead over the bed and you just like it's it holds it this is one of the few times that they hold something in this film <laughs> and you're waiting and you just see the blood trickle out from the foot of the bed and just like flood out and so i thought that was actually if there's anything positive to say about the remake it's that it is very it's a very well shot film it looks great like you would expect a blumhouse production to be the weird thing with this movie is though like it was being made there was no marketing no publicity it Mm. didn't go to theaters like it was dumped i i I owned the blu-ray only because we got a review copy of it like i don't i don't know what was going on with this movie and why it didn't even get not even a theatrical release which whatever but like not even like a push for vod and streaming it's so bizarre to me I feel like they knew it was a lost cause. I mm. I don't know if they didn't have faith in the final film or if they just realized, oh shit, we made a bad decision. This original is too well beloved and we have not done a good enough job adapting it. Because yeah. this, I mean, I say, I, I know I do this a lot, but this mm-hmm. remake feels defanged. They took it does. all of the things that work the best about the original, not just the gore, but the relationship, like the time, the relationship between the two girls and the the process, like the torture in this 2015 remake is non-existent. We see an extended take of Lucy getting her back flayed. And then they don't show it ever again. Yeah. They just show her in her regular clothes strung mm-hmm. up in well, front she of just, everyone. She doesn't get fully flayed. It's just the back. And again, that sounds silly. It's just her back skin getting just pulled Just her off. back. Come on. Um, but here, here's the thing, because I, I don't hate... The, we discussed this off mic, but the Martyrs remake is a better movie than the Inside remake. Or at least it has more of a purpose. Oh because, my god, yes. Because this movie, while it is defanged, 
it has a different focus. The focus of the remake isn't on the philosophy. It's more yeah. about the friendship. Now, it, it, it removes the queerness between the girls completely. There's oh, no yeah. attempted kiss. Of course it does. Um, of course it does. Blumhouse. Yay. Or 2015 Blumhouse. You know, Happy Death Day comes out two years later. It focuses on them as friends, and that is the focus. It's not about the organization, even though it does come into play. Uh, and, and and Mademoiselle is played by Kate Burton, who uh, listeners may know as uh, Dr. Ellis Gray from Grey's Anatomy or Vice President Sally Langston from Scandal. That's what I know her from. And she's a huge cunt. But the it's weird. So we didn't discuss this in the original, but the what, what gets Anna caught is that when she calls her mother, she leaves the phone off the hook. And the organization is trying to call and they can't get through. So that's what brings them to the house to begin with. What the remake does is Anna calls the cops and we are led to believe that the organization has even more power because the cops are under their thumbs. It's motherfucking Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Yes, it's very much like that. And it's and so there's a scene later when Mademoiselle, I don't even know what her name, oh, her name is Eleanor, I think, in the remake. Um, she is explaining to Anna everything that they're doing, just like in the original uh. But, but, like, not half as well. <laughs> not half as well. And says, oh, yeah, you actually brought us here because you called the cops. Um, but uh, what? why this doesn't work for me, though, and why this exposition dump doesn't work for me compared to the original is because Lucy is alive. They are still using Lucy as their as their yeah. end goal of martyrdom. Yeah, she is their preferred choice. Anna is like, oh, who fucking cares that you're even here? And yes. then they, what? What do they do? They dump her in the ground and bury her alive in the hole in the back. Which, yep. uh, that's fine, but then why are you giving her this exposition dump if you don't give a shit about her? If you're just gonna bury her, why even take the time? Oh, wait, is it for the audience? Because yep. you don't trust us? <laughs> yep. And it's it's so weird. It's a It's a really odd choice. And I think it's just because when it came out, Pretty Little Liars was still, like, in peak popularity, maybe maybe not as much as it was in like 2012, let's say. Uh, yeah, but still, still quite popular. But yeah, no, I went into this thinking, oh, they're gonna kill their biggest star in the film halfway through, and they don't. And they um, don't. but what makes the film kind of work for me, and again, this is like a two and a half. I, I gave this, I did review this for Bloody when it came out, and I gave it a three in the Bloody Disgusting review, and I, it's impossible to watch this film without comparing it to the original. Yeah. But the ending scene, basically, they have Lucy crucified and they they burn her at the stake but then she's never like she doesn't have any burn marks on her <laughs> it's no. really weird but she basically anna gets a gun and runs through and kills a bunch of people and then she goes there and she gets like lucy off the cross and lucy is experiencing martyrdom and whispers to anna what she has seen mm -hmm. the priest overhears it and blows his brains out <laughs> <laughs> yeah, which doesn't work. No, it doesn't work at all. Um, but it's it, but then Eleanor K. Burton's like, "What did she see?" And Lucy and Anna goes, "You tell me." And then blows her brains out, kills her. Which that's again the, the easy catharsis that they're trying to give American audiences, and yeah. that is treating us like we're stupid. I hate that. Well, the the whole thing is that if you're not going to kill Lucy and turn Anna into your martyr, mm -hmm. then. You don't need Anna. So Anna just becomes the really conventional final girl. Yes. Where, you know, she's grabbing weapons. She's surviving getting stabbed. She, you know, she survives getting buried alive. Her whole purpose is literally just to get back to her. And then you, and then you bury the lead. She does all this like stupid killing. And then she still dies from yeah. her pain, but she has also achieved martyrdom. Yes. Oh so my it, god, it feels like a slap in the face. I, I, I don't mind her also achieving, I mean, it, it doesn't make any sense, but I also don't no. think the film does a great job enough of, like, explaining this concept of martyrdom as the original does. No. no. It's nice because the friendship survives, like, they both gone to this new place right. together. The, the film ends with both of them, like, like Anna is, like, draped herself over Lucy, and they are both, yeah, martyring out, looking at the sky um, as they slowly die. And that's it. The film blacks out. out. I know. It's it's a little <laughs> shocky, but the reason I give this remake at least a little bit of credit is because it at least does something different with the property. Not wholly successfully, but it does something. And it... it it's not one I'm ever going to want to watch again, because um, I've already seen it twice. But I think if you didn't have the original, it would maybe play a little bit better, but not. it's still not great. 
Yeah, I to be honest, I just think it's too out there a concept to have successfully adapted for a North American audience. Mm-hmm. So you either needed to really just adapt it exactly the way it was and just make all the actors American, or I don't know. Like I just think the philosophy is too integral to what this film is trying to do. So to do it only halfway as the American remake does, mm-hmm. it just it feels so watered down. I mean, yeah, absolutely. And it's by design. And that feels like a... And I don't know if that was the producers or if that was the directors or mm-hmm. even just the writer. I don't know. But again, I think it's a very pretty film. I think it's shot very well. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't look bad. The girls are trying. They just don't really have a lot to work with. I, I think it's an editing issue, to be honest. I think like a lot of the reasons... Like, yeah, I do think their performances are good. But I think that editing kills a lot of the momentum for me. Well, it's also not scary. (laughs) No, no, it's not scary at all. But yeah, so that's the Martyrs remake. Check it out if you want to, I guess. But Or or just watch watch the original. (laughs) Just watch the original. (laughs) Um, So yeah, I I mean, that's going to wrap up that discussion. Uh, Obviously, you know, there's a lot of things to talk about in this film. Please let us know. Message us, whatever. Talk about shit. Um, So uh, on that note, though, if you'd like to contact us, you can visit our Horror Queers Facebook page or join our uh, Horror Queers Facebook group. Tweet us at Horror Queers or email us at horrorqueers at gmail.com. Uh, we would love it if you would go to iTunes and leave us a review. Or if you don't have the time for a review, leave us just a star rating. That works, too. If you want even more content, please visit our Patreon page at patreon.com slash horrorqueers, where you can sign up for bonus episodes covering recent horror films like Gretel and Hansel and Blumhouse's Fantasy Island. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and ten dollar patrons will also have an ep- uh, an audio commentary on Valentine, uh, which we dropped last week, just in time for Valentine's Day. Predictable, but appropriate. Joe, mm-hmm. what are we talking about next week for my birthday? Well, you know, I I was tempted to just kick it back to you because it's your birthday, but uh, yeah, you have decided that your birthday pick. We are going to watch Zombievers. <laughs> Why have we both chosen such random picks for our birthday? <laughs> I I don't know if we will have a lot. To, like, this might be a 45 minute episode for all I know. I have no idea. It, the movie, I think, is about 72 minutes long. And that is including the animated opening credit sequence. Um, oh, God. It's, what am I in for here? <laughs> I, I genuinely love this movie. I think it's so funny. But again, y'all, it's it's not a queer content movie, although there is a Lady Gaga joke that's really funny. And there's no substance to it. So... We may just be drinking wine and having fun with it, so it might not be a regular episode next week, but that's what I wanted for my birthday, because it drops the day before my birthday, so. There we go. Yeah, um, but that'll be next week, and on that note, we can cross out (laughs) Martyrses. Yes, I'm going to go Martyrs out for a little while, so uh, (laughs) cross out Horror Queers. Disgusting podcast network, home of creepy, or disturbing, and terrifying creepy pastas, SCP archives, weekly full cast storytelling, horror queers, genre commentary from an LGBTQ perspective, and the Boo Crew. For horror centric interviews, listen free wherever you stream audio and at bloodydisgusting.com slash podcasts. Get in, losers. This is the Lady Killers, a feminine rage podcast. I'm Jen. I'm Sammy. I'm Rocco. And I'm May. Our podcast is a tribute to the female identifying killers in horror and more. Each episode will feature us, your Supreme Court of female murderers, discussing our favorite lady killers from your Julias and Jennifers to your Carries and Christines. We'll tell her story, decide if it's good for her horror, and answer the most important question of all. Would we die for her? Join us on Thursdays as we pull on our sweaters, snatch our ice picks, sharpen our scissors, and honor the lady killers who live on the silver screen. No boys were harmed in the making of this podcast. Yet. It was late in the afternoon when the professor and I took our way towards the east, whence I knew Jonathan was coming. 
Jonathan Harker has asked me to note this, as he says he is hardly equal to the task, and he wants an exact record kept. Dear Madam Mina, I have read your husband's so wonderful diary. Strange and terrible as it is, it is true. I will pledge my life on it. God preserve my sanity, for to this I am reduced. Safety and the assurance of safety are things of the past. I am in hopes that I shall see more of you at Castle Dracula. <laughs> <laughs> Listen to Regarding Dracula wherever you listen to podcasts, or find us online at bloody.fm.